Let me start with a story of three little boys. My name is Gerhard, and I'm one of them. You can see me here in my first car. Well, I was born in 1952 under quite poor conditions. In our small village, only one family had a telephone, and cars were rarely seen. The toilet was outside the house, and our neighbor, the oldest man in that village, still plowed his field with a very heavy field plow horse. We called the neighbor Grandpa Lempke. Once I was still a little boy, he told me about his childhood when there were no electricity, no telephones, no cars, no planes. So please imagine Grandpa Lempke as the second little boy. And the third one of these three boys was his great-grandfather. When Grandpa Lemke was a child, his great-grandfather was the oldest man in the town as well. And he told Grandpa Lemke when he was a child, he saw the Napoleon army on its retreat after the defeat in 1815. This is more than 200 years ago. This gives you a glimpse of how much the world changed in the lifetime of three little boys connected through the time. A change like no other in the history of mankind. And if I tell today to a little boy, he will most likely see the year 2100, how will the world look like then? 200 years ago, the world population was 1 billion, and today it's almost 8, and in 2100, it will be around 11. The population of Africa will triple, and the largest cities of the world will be in Africa in 2100. And all these people need housing. In the last 200 years, mankind has erected more buildings than in all the time before that, and yet it is not enough. Every fifth person on this planet does not have a proper shelter. Worldwide, we are lacking 440 million housing units. And although we actually building not enough, we already consume more material than our planet can sustain. We now use every year more sand than all the rivers in the world produce in erosion material in a year. And sand is already in short supply. You might wonder, one-sixth of the world's landmass is made out of sand. So why is sand in short supply? Well, because you can't use desert sand for making concrete, cement concrete. Therefore, even the Arab countries have to import sand into their desert countries. It's a little bit like water. We have shortage of water. On the other hand, we have oceans full of water, but you can't drink salt water. And building causes another problem, rubbish. For at least 5,000 years, mankind has been building over and over on the remains of the past. To explore the past, we have to dig through mountains of rubble. Our economy of make, take, waste, leads to ever larger mountains of rubble, turning the landfills and the world cities into future mining areas. It is very obvious that we cannot afford to keep building like we did. We not only have not enough sand, but we also do not have enough air and water as well. 
the CO2 emissions of the cement industry accounts for 7 to 8 percent of all emissions. In view of this, humanity is forced to rethink. But what does that have to do with me? The turning point in my life came on 12th January 2010. After the terrible earthquake in Haiti, I wanted to help. But I quickly realized then that just giving money does not really help the affected. These people are traumatized. Many of them not only lost their homes, but also family members. And I'm absolutely convinced that after such a trauma, it is essential for those affected to actively participate in the rebuilding in order not to lose their spirit and their will to live. So I really wanted to empower those people to rebuild their homes with their own hands, without heavy machines, with material find on site. Luckily, at that time, in 2010, I happened to know an East German engineer who had already succeeded in making a super strong building material from desert sand. Based on this invention, we then jointly founded the company with the clear goal to develop a process to empower people to build with local material and their bare hands. Our motto for this was help others to help themselves. For this purpose, we have developed a plant that can produce its new building material in a simple and environmentally friendly way. The material produced in this way then become as hard as granite in just a few minutes. And we shaped it like Lego bricks because already all the kids know how easy you can build with Lego. These bricks consist of 90% local filler materials, such as desert sand, and a binder material for which we use polyester resin, which is partly made of, out of recycled PET bottles. Our blocks are 30 centimeters high and up to 60 centimeters long. And the heaviest block is just 15 kilogram. To put it brief, it's Lego for adults and for outside. And this is how it works. On the ground floor, you put a kind of Lego base bar with holes for threaded ho rods, and the bricks are stuck over these rods. And finally, there's a cover strip on top that functions as a ring anchor. Finally, you screw the threaded rods, and this creates st the structural strength of the building. Now today, our solution sounds simple, and you may ask, why wasn't it invented before? Well, it took us seven long years to solve all the nitty-gritty details to produce it and to build it. And after seven years, we started our first project in Namibia. The Namibian government had asked us to build a model house in Windhoek during a conference to prove the social acceptance of our material and of our building method. So we produced the house, shipped it in a container to Windhoek, and started building. We had only two days to build. So the Namibian government gave us four unskilled workers to help us, two men and two women. And on the parking lot of a hotel, we started laying the baseboards. To protect the car park, we piled up sand in beforehand. 
Then we showed how to align and connect the base slats, especially how to level it. And that was on Sunday morning, and we should have been finished on Tuesday. Leveling and connecting the ground bars took most of Sunday morning. On Sunday afternoon, we were able to start putting things together. Each of the Namibians got a corner of the house for this. And this young lady here, who started working in a paving stone factory as a child, understood the system immediately. And at the end of the day, she was one of the happiest people I have ever seen. Because she stood in front of her part of the house and saw what she was capable of. By Sunday evening, we finished the base building. On Monday morning, we started with the roof. Then we fixed the steel rods and mounting the roof panels. Like the walls, the roof is very well insulated. And while it was about 40 degrees outside when we built it, Inside the house, we had a pleasant temperature of 25 degrees. We installed windows and doors, put in a floor, and during the night, some furniture. And Tuesday morning, the whole building was finished. Tuesday morning, at the opening of the conference, the house was opened by the president of Namibia, and the whole cabinet came. But in the following week, it seemed that all of Namibia um, came and inspected the house, knocked at the doors, and everybody found it really, really good. This was the starting signal for us to plan a production in Namibia and um, to look for appropriate partners. Of course, the house could not remain on the parking lot of the hotel, so we donated the house to the government for a good cause. And the government of Namibia gave the house to the family of Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips is a victim of apartheid. He was almost beaten to death by South African soldiers. Um, and he married his nurse. They have six children, and they live in this corrugated iron hut. This is the kitchen. Um, there were only two mattresses inside. Um, the toilet is outside, and the living condition reminded me somehow of Grandfather Lemke's tale from a hundred years ago. The Namibians, whom we showed how to build the house, took it apart piece by piece, transported it the 20 kilometers to the Phillips, and started rebuilding it. We had to make slight, slightly a change in the building um, and flew in additional blocks from Germany to Namibia, but then in a few weeks, we built the new house. And this, you might remember, was the leader of the pack. I think you can clearly see how she has grown with the whole task. Again, it took only a few days to rebuild. The new house was finished. The family ne dressed nicely. The president of Namibia himself came and handed over the house and the family moved in. And this is how they live now. In the background, you can see Nadja Phillips, who wrote me a moving letter. She said, I was always afraid of the weather in the old house. When it rained, we got wet. And when it was cold, we had to freeze terribly, despite all the blankets and clothes mom gave us. And then she said, and now sometimes I don't know even what the weather is like, and I only need one blanket. A year later, a new factory was built 20 kilometers outside of Windhoek. Um, the majority of this company is owned by Namibians, and we hired unskilled people from the nearby informal settlement. The complete value chain remains in the country. 
And like the young woman who, who now can build houses, these workers have also grown visibly in their tasks. Ten years after the destroyed church in Haiti, we have built a first small church in Namibia. This gives me great hope and confidence in the future. Maybe the stones from this church and additional ones will later change this church into a cathedral or maybe into a university. I'm convinced that this small stone is not only the foundation stone for this church, but the foundation stone for the transformation of the construction industry towards a sustainable and circular economy. Thank you very much. <laughs>